January 1998, I was standing in the water at Playa de Amarillo, beautiful little beach on the outskirts of Havana, Cuba. We were baptizing over 600 people that day, 35 pastors in the water doing the baptizing. Finally, I noticed a little old lady, little Cuban lady, coming up to me. It was her turn, finally, to be baptized. So I showed her how to put her hands on my arm and to hold tight, and she went like that. And I said, no, you need to hold on tight. And she goes, like that. And I said, no, no. I said, abre la mano y póngala acá. And she looked up at me, tears welling up in her eye, and said, mi pastor, no puedo abrirla. I can't open it. Her hand had been frozen shut ever since she was born. And I said, you know, one day soon, Jesus is going to come. He's going to give you a new hand and a new body. And she said, do you really think Jesus is going to come here to Cuba? I said, I think Cuba might be the first place that Jesus is going to come. Because when people are oppressed, Jesus is going to be there. Good news. Jesus is coming again. Amen. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, when I start feeling a little discouraged and weary. John chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, Jesus said. In my Father's house are many rooms. King James says mansions. I think I like that better. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now watch this. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. Now I don't know any way to understand that verse except that Jesus is promising us that he is preparing a place for us and he is going to come back again and take us out of this old world so that we can be with him in his Father's house above. Amen? Amen. That's the good news. That's the day that we're waiting for. But there's bad news. Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 5, Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you, because in verse 5, many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. Good news, Jesus is coming again. Bad news, many are coming in the name of Christ, and they will deceive many people. Now, I want you to notice something important here. The deception. The deception is not over the question of whether or not Jesus is going to come. The people who are deceived about the return of Christ are not deceived concerning whether he's going to... They don't believe he's not coming. They are expecting him to come. They are deceived because they're going after the wrong Christ. They are deceived 
concerning not whether or not he's going to return, but how he returns. Because if you know how Jesus is going to return, you will never be deceived by the wrong Christ. And the world today is being set up for massive deception concerning the very return of Jesus Christ himself. Two popular books, Left Behind and The Last Disciple, Left Behind by Tim LaHaye, The Last Disciple by Hank Hanegraaff. Left Behind says that all of Revelation practically is yet in the future. And Jesus comes for the church, snatches the church out of the way, and leaves the wicked behind for seven years of tribulation. Hank Hanegraaff, Last Disciple, both novels saying, no, that's nonsense. Jesus has already come. The beast has already come. It's all in the past, not in the future. Now, they cannot both be right. So which one is right? Maybe neither one. Because they both say, this is a novel. The truth is in here. Now there's another deception. We were doing a meeting, a Revelation Now meeting in Danville, Virginia, just on the border of North Carolina, and after two days off, a young fellow came up to me that night at the meeting, and he said, Pastor, you'll never guess where I was yesterday. I said, you're right. <laughs> I said, where were you? Tell me. He said, I went to, I can't even remember, some little town in North Carolina. And he said, Jesus was there. I said, oh. He said, you need to go, Pastor. It was wonderful. He was healing people and talking about the Bible. And as he spoke, love just was flowing out. And so many people were saved. You need to go, Pastor. And I said, no. I'm not going to go. He said, why not? Because that wasn't Jesus. He said, well, if you would have been there, you would have believed it was Jesus. And I said, that's why I'm not going to go. <laughs> Don't put yourself on the devil's turf. Don't play the devil's game. You're going to lose that one every time. He said, well, how do you know it wasn't Jesus? It was Jesus. How do you know it wasn't? And I said, well, just listen to what Jesus said. In Matthew 24, verse 23, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. You said, there he is, I don't believe it. Period. If anybody tells you, there he is out in the desert, don't go out. Or here he is in the inner room, don't believe it. Why not? Because, in verse 27, as lightning that comes from the east is visible even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Somebody says he's out in North Carolina or he's in Utah or Salt Lake City or Jerusalem in a temple. Do not go. Do not believe it. Why? Because when Jesus comes, it's going to be like lightning flashing from the east to the west and you will see it because you can see lightning even with your eyes shut. You don't need anybody to tell you Jesus has already come. His coming will be a glorious visible event, like lightning coming from these. Once again, it's time for us to line up some fence posts. Now, I know some of the things I'm about to say are going to be a bit of a struggle for some of you because it's not exactly what you've been taught and what you've been reading in the popular books and watching on TV. But folks, it's time for us to get our noses in the Word of God and believe what's in here. Amen? Amen. So let's start with a new page on our word processor. What's on it? No, one verse. Lightning flashing from the east to the west, all right? We already got one verse. And we got a fence post. But we need some more fence posts, so let's line up some more fence posts. Same chapter, 
verse 30, at that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all of the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now we're going to look at every verse that describes the return of Christ. So far two of them describe Christ coming in a glorious visible event. You will see Him. Even the nations will see Him. They will mourn because of Him. Same thing that He says to the church in Revelation chapter the one. Revelation first chapter seventh verse. Look he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him and all of the people on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Do you know what amen means? So be it. So shall it be. So how is Jesus coming? He's coming on the clouds. Every eye will see him. The wicked will see him. Even those who pierced him will see him. They will mourn. Amen? Amen. He said it twice. Now, if somebody asked me one time, well, how's that possible? Why are the blind people going to see Jesus when he comes? Well, if Jesus knew how to open the eyes of the blind when he was here, I doubt if he's forgotten how to do it when he comes again. Secondly, they asked me, well, how is everybody going to see him? Because the earth's round, and if he comes over there, then the Chinese can't see him. Now, I don't know the answer to that question, but I know this. If he can speak and bring the world into existence, he's going to make sure everybody can see him when he comes. <laughs> I just know this, when Jesus comes, every eye will see him. And you won't need anyone to tell you, hey, Jesus came. He said, I know, I see. Acts chapter 1, same thing. Acts chapter 1, verse 9, he's speaking his last words to the church. And after he said that, verse 9, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Notice again, the visible event. Jesus went up. They saw him go up into the clouds, and they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus has been taken from you into heaven will come back. How's he going to come back? in the same way that you have seen him go. They saw him go up into the clouds and he is going to come back in the same way they saw him go. We will see him coming. It will be a visible, glorious event when Jesus returns for his church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. A lot of fence posts to line up tonight. And this one, I think virtually all scholars agree, no matter which side of the fence they're on, this one is the clearest outline of the sequence of events that take place when Jesus comes for the church. And this is the passage that's often called the rapture passage. Now understand the word rapture is not found in the Bible anywhere. But it doesn't matter because rapture means the catching up. God's people will be caught up to be with Him. That's true. We are going to be caught up. So calling it the rapture doesn't change a thing. It's the timing of the rapture that's significant. So let's take a look at the clearest verses that outline the sequence of events that take place at the rapture. Verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. He talks about the dead as asleep, asleep in Christ. Don't be ignorant. They were thinking that the dead weren't going to get to go to heaven. They died. It was finished over. He says, no, don't worry about that. Verse 14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So he's going to bring them back to heaven. How is he going to do it? Watch, here's the answer. Verse 15, according to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive and who are left, underline that word, left, we who are still alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
Don't worry about them. Jesus is going to come. He's going to take them. How's he going to do it? Well, we who are still alive and are left, we're not going to go before them. No. Well, how are we all going to go? And here's his answer. Verse 16. Are you ready for this? For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a trumpet call of God, with a voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first. There will be a lot of noise. There will be a visible, glorious appearing, like lightning flashing from the east to the west. The dead are going to come out of their graves. The earth will rumble. There will be a lot of stuff going on when Jesus comes for us. Amen. Sounds noisy. Sounds visible. Voice of the archangel, trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ rise first. After that, watch, here it is again. We who are still alive and left... Underline that word again. We who are still alive and left, where are we left? We're left still alive at the time Jesus comes. So we who are still alive and left, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will go to be with the Lord forever. So the dead in Christ will be raised up. First, then we are changed and together we'll be caught up to go to be with Jesus up in the clouds. Clear as it can be. We don't go before them. They don't go before us. We go together. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Greek and so who toss means in this way. This is how you and I, this is how the church goes to be with the Lord. How? Either we are alive and left when Jesus comes and are changed, or we have died and will be raised up. Either way, together we will all be caught up to go to be with Jesus. That's how we go to be with the Lord. I don't know how to say it. He couldn't say it any clearer than this. Yet practically millions and millions of people are being taught that when Jesus comes, it will be a secret snatching away and the wicked are going to run around wondering, where did they go? And be left for a long period, some say seven years, some say three and a half years of tribulation. They can't agree on that where they get a second chance. Where did that idea come from? Not from here. Where did it come from? You're going to be surprised. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic priest, began teaching was saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not by works. And the church said, no, no, Luther was saved by faith and works. Luther said, well, the Bible teaches we're saved by faith alone. And the church said, Luther... Remember, it's not the Bible. It's the Bible and the traditions of the church. We're saved by works, not by faith alone. And Luther said, well, I'm going to stick with the Scripture. Sola Scriptura. That was his battle cry. And remember, millions and millions of Christians, that's when he called the church, that's when he called the Pope the Antichrist. Millions of Christians were leaving Rome. It's no secret. It's the Protestant Reformation. Millions left. And Rome had to decide, what are we going to do? We need to figure out how to stop this massive outflow of protesters. So they did several things. They met at the Council of Trent. They officially decreed that tradition is equal to Scripture and that you have to believe the traditions of the church. Then the next thing that happened, they still had Luther calling them the Antichrist. And the Methodist, Wesley's calling them Antichrist. And the Baptist and the Presbyterian, they were all calling Rome Antichrist. Say, so we got to figure out a way to deal with that. And so one Jesuit scholar, Alcazar, said, well, it's simple. Look, Nero was the beast. Jesus came already, and he's establishing his kingdom on this earth already right now. And so it's all in the past, preterist. And that's where the Last Disciple novel series came from. It's all in the past. It was an attempt to keep the Reformers from believing that the Church of Rome was Antichrist. And then Rivera said, well, I'm not sure that everybody's going to go for that. 
So another Jesuit scholar, Rivera, said, I think that all of this is in the future, and the Antichrist is going to come way off in the future. So it can't be us. We're here now. We've been here since the beginning. can't be us. So the devil doesn't care if you believe it's all in the past or if you believe it's all in the future. It doesn't matter. One or the other. So we have two books, Left Behind and The Last Disciple, both coming from an anti-Protestant approach to Scripture designed to turn Protestants away from pointing to Rome and saying that you're the Antichrist. And the Protestant world has virtually embraced it today. But the Bible is clear. When Jesus comes, it's a glorious, visible event. Watch this. This is really stunning. Now remember, when the Bible was written, they didn't separate verses and chapters. They didn't even separate words. All ran together. So let's just look at the next verse. After verse 18, chapter 4, verse 18, therefore encourage each other with these words. V chapter 5, verse 1, the very next thing. Same thought, continuing on. Now, brothers, about the time and dates, we don't need to write to you because you know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You ever see the gospel film, The Thief in the Night? The man's in the bathroom shaving with his electric shaver and his wife is in the bedroom talking through the doorway and all of a sudden he quit answering. She says, why don't you answer me? What's wrong with you? And she looks in there and the razor is just vibrating on the countertop and he's gone. She looks all over the house, can't find him, picks up the phone, calls her friend, hey, my husband disappeared. I wonder what's happening. Yeah, my wife's gone. What's going on here? They turn on the TV. Millions of people have vanished away. Jesus came like a thief in the night, and he took him. But that's not what we read here. Yeah, he comes like a thief in the night. He says, you know very well, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But what happens when Jesus comes like a thief? You see, there are two ways that he can come like a thief in the night, two ways a thief can come. One way, you just buy this nice new big panel TV set so you can show your Revelation Now DVDs on. And you go watch a DVD, then you go to bed, and while you're asleep, a thief comes in, and he takes that big screen off the wall, and you come down in the morning, and where's my TV set? Thief came in the night and took it. Or you could be sitting there watching your TV set, and the thief sneaks in in the night, and conk on top of the head. And takes your TV set. See, he surprises you. You're not expecting it. Now, what was Paul thinking when he wrote, Jesus comes like a thief in the night? Which way? Watch. It's easy. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. And they'll not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness so that they would surprise you like a thief. He's not coming like a thief to the church. He's coming like a thief to the wicked. They're not ready. They're not expecting him to come. They're sitting there watching their TV sets. They get conked with destruction. So how many wicked people are going to be running around on this earth after Jesus comes like a thief in the night. See how clear when you line up your fence post? Just in case you're not convinced, here's the clincher. The next letter that he writes to the same church, 2 Thessalonia, 2 Thessalonians, verse 6, God is just, and he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. Now, who is you? You've got to identify the pronouns in this passage. So who is the you? God is just, and he's going to pay back trouble to those who trouble you. Who's he talking to? The church. Are you with me? The church. So let's say that. God is just. He'll pay back trouble to those who trouble the church and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. Who is the you? The church. 
So God is going to pay back and give relief to the church. That's crystal clear. Now, when is he going to do it? Watch. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. So when does the church get delivered from and relief from the struggles and the stress and the tribulation in the world when Jesus comes quietly like a thief in the night? When Jesus comes with blazing fire and his angels with him. Now watch this. Verse 8. He will punish those who do not know God. That's all the wicked. He will punish all the wicked who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His power. When are those ungodly, when are those wicked going to be punished with destruction? Watch. On the day that he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. That includes you, the church, because you have believed. Now, how can he say it any clearer than that? When Jesus comes to bring relief to the church, he will punish the wicked with everlasting destruction when he comes to deliver you and to be glorified in you. So how many wicked people are going to be running around on this earth when Jesus comes to deliver his church? None. None at all. If the wicked are destroyed when Jesus comes to bring relief to the church, then tell me, how can there be a tribulation force at work in this world trying to save people after the wicked have been destroyed? You see, the truth that was left out or left behind is that it's all a novel after chapter 1. Jesus is coming. After that, it's a novel because the wicked are destroyed with everlasting destruction when Jesus comes to bring relief to his church. With blazing fire, he even says. That means that the church, some of you have already figured it out, the church is going to be in this world all the way through until the end, even during the time of great tribulation. We're going to be here. The pastor don't tell me that. Well, that's not as bad as it sounds. Because God doesn't have to take us out of the world to protect us from tribulation in the world. In fact, he tells us that in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. To the church at Philadelphia, he writes, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. So since you've been faithful, I am going to keep you from the hour of trial. He does not say, I'm going to take you out of the world before the hour of trial. Now, your footnotes might say that, but that's not the Bible. The Bible says, I will keep you from the hour of trial. The Greek word here that says, I will keep you, that Greek word is terrain ek. What does terrain ek mean? I will guard you. I will protect you. Watch this. He uses that same Greek word in John chapter 17, verse 15. In the Gospel of John, chapter 17 and verse 15. Exact same word. Jesus said, verse 15, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you terrain ek, that you protect them from the evil one. 
He uses terrain ek in exact opposition to the idea of taking them out of the world. No, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but you protect them. So I will keep you from the time of trial. Not take you out of it, but protect you while in it. Just like he did with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, those three faithful Hebrew servants, the king said, bow down and worship the image and everybody who does it. I'll throw you into the fire. Well, they stood tall and everybody else bowed down. And the king comes and throws them into the fire. Now, God could have prevented the king from throwing them into the fire, but he allowed them to be cast into the fiery furnace. And then he looks in there. He says, how many did we put in there? And he said, oh, king, three. Well, look, I see one, two, three, four, and one looks like a son of man. Jesus came and protected them and delivered them in the middle of their fiery trial. It takes more faith in God. It takes more of a demonstration of God's power for Him to protect us during the tribulation than to snatch us out of the world before the tribulation. There is not one verse in the Bible that says He's going to take us away before the tribulation. Not one verse. Are we going to be here through till the end? Watch this. This is one of my favorite places in Psalm that talks about it. Psalm 91, verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. You better trust Him because what's going to happen? Look at verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. It will not come near you. God is big enough to protect you. You'll see it. You'll see him fall to the left and to the right, but it's not coming to you. There's nothing in here in the Scripture not one verse. It talks about God taking us out before the tribulation. Somebody said, well, he loves us too much to let us go through it. Oh, well, didn't he love John and let him be beheaded? Didn't he love Peter who got crucified upside down? Didn't he love Isaiah when he let him get sawed in half in a hollow log? God's people have been tormented and persecuted through the years. Of course he loves them. But what a demonstration of love to protect us from the fiery trial. You don't have to be afraid of the tribulation as long as you follow the Lamb. Not one verse says we'll be taken out of this world. Not one verse. Well, what about the one that says two men will be in the field? One will be taken, the other left. There it is, Pastor. Well, let's take a look at that verse. Don't want to miss anything here, Matthew Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24, verse 41, two women will be grinding grain with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. You see? There's the rapture. They're grinding grain with a handmill. One gets taken, the other left, and she's grinding away, wondering where did she get taken to? Not fair. I got to do it all myself now. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say anything like that. In fact, it says just the opposite. You see, that's what happens when you take one fence post and try to line it up, one verse out of context. It comes out opposite of what God wanted it to say. Watch, so easy. Back up a little bit. Verse 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so it'll be at the coming of the Son of Man. So what is it going to be like when Jesus comes? It'll be like it was in the days of Noah. What was it like then? Verse 38, for in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and what? Took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Now, what is it going to be like at the coming of Jesus? It's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. 
Well, what was it like then? Well, they were eating, drinking, marrying, doing all these things, and they were not aware of anything until what? The flood came, and what did it do? It took them all away. Now, who? Here's the question. Who was taken away in the days of Noah? The wicked. Where were they taken to? Under the water to their destruction. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Who is taken? Who was taken in the days of Noah? The wicked. Who is left? The righteous. This verse isn't talking about rapturing up to Jesus at all. If you read it in the context of the chapter, it's talking about when Jesus comes, there'll be two categories of people, sheep and goats, good and the bad. The wicked are going to be taken away, burned, destroyed. The righteous are going to be left. Then, yes, we're caught up to be with Jesus, but that's not what this verse is talking about. It's just the opposite. It's the wicked taken, the righteous are left. Do you want to be taken or left? <laughs> I want to be left. I want to be left behind. <laughs> That's a switch, isn't it? Are you sure, preacher? Did you come out right on that? Nobody else is saying that. Well, they are. You're not hearing, but look, let's double check and ask Jesus again. Jesus, did Cologne get it right? Luke chapter 17, verse 34 I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed and one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. See, same thing. But here's the difference. The disciples asked him, where, Lord? Now stop here for a second. Jesus just said, two women will be grinding grain. One will be taken, the other left. And the disciples say, where? Which one are they asking about? The one that's taken or the one that's left grinding grain? I mean, they know where the one that's left is. She's still there by the grain. Where, Lord? Where are you going to take him? Isn't that the question? Look at his answer. He replied, where there's a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Where are they taken? to their destruction. And there's our link to Revelation. When Jesus comes, the wicked will be taken to their destruction where the dead bodies are, the vultures are gathered. That's not a very pretty picture, but kind of get it in fuzzy focus so you can remember it again. So now we're ready to understand the millennium. Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation, the 19th chapter. And by the way, while you're looking for that one, turning to it, let's review. So far what we've seen. Jesus comes. Visible, glorious return. We're caught up to be with him. The wicked are destroyed. So who's left on this world? We're in heaven. The wicked are destroyed. Who's left to have a second chance? Nobody. There is no second chance after Jesus comes. If you're going to get ready, you better get ready now. Don't wait until after. There's no second chance. Who would like for you to think there's a second chance? That's an easy one. Now, let's go to Revelation. Verse 7, chapter 19, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, is given for her to wear. The bride is ready. The Lamb is ready to come for his bride. The problem is his bride is under attack by the beast and the kings of the earth holding her captive. So what's going to happen? Good news. 
Chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire. Verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Who's the rider on the horse? That's Jesus. Who's he coming to make war against? Look, verse 19, I saw the beast and all the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse. They're not there to make war against Israel. It doesn't say that. They're there to make war against the lamb. But he's not a lamb. This time he's a warrior riding on a horse. Why? Because the kings of the earth and the beast are after God's people. He's coming to deliver us. Good news. Amen? They gather together and make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet in the middle of verse 20, the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. So the beast, false prophet, are destroyed. Who's left then out of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? The dragon. The dragon is the devil. Beast, counterfeit system of worship developed in the church of Rome early in the medieval times. False prophet, Protestant America, working together with Rome to acknowledge her authority to change God's Word. Another counterfeit system of worship. They're both cast into the fire. No more counterfeits anymore. Just the dragon against Jesus. Good against evil. This final conflict has come down to the very bottom line. No more pretending to be God. No more deceiving people. I am the Lord God. Nope, that's done. That's over. We're getting to the final, final phase of this conflict. Two of them were thrown into the lake of fire. Now watch, 21. The rest of them, who's that? All of those who join with them in rebellion against God. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. And that's exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. There's a description of the return of Christ. Good news if you follow the Lamb. Bad news for those who follow the beast. What happens next? Chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down out of heaven, having a key to the abyss, holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil of Satan. He bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore till the thousand years were ended. After that, he'd be set free for a short time. Now, folks, Revelation is a symbolic book. You understand that. There's no bottomless pit. King James translates it bottomless pit. Not a very good translation. There's no bottomless pit that's going to hold Satan. The Greek word there is abusas. There's something interesting about that Greek word, abusas. In the Old Testament, Greek version of the Old Testament, the one that Jesus had, the actual version that Jesus used when he was here, it was in Greek. And it, back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the surface of the deep. And that word deep is abusas. A wild, empty, chaotic wilderness of nothing before Jesus began creating order. And that's the way it's going to be at the end. He'll be cast into an abusas, an abyss, a wild, chaotic nothing. The wicked are destroyed. The righteous are gone. There's nothing left on this earth. Every mountain flees. Every island is gone. There's nothing left on this earth. Jeremiah says the cities are in ruins. There are no birds in the air. It's empty. It's only the devil. Maybe his angel's with him, but we know the devil is there. If it was a bottomless pit, he could go down to the other end and come out in China. Not a bottomless pit. It's an abusas. 
He can't deceive the nations. Why not? Because there are no nations for him to deceive their debt. He has a thousand years. Watch. Cast in the bottomless pit and sealed and it kept him from deceiving the nations anymore till the thousand years were ended. After that, he'd be set free for a short time. So now we have a thousand years where Satan is bound. When does it begin? Verse 4. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, they had not worshipped the beast or his image. They had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So when do the thousand years begin? They begin with the resurrection of the saints of Jesus Christ. When are the saints resurrected? They are resurrected when Jesus comes with a loud command, trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ arise first. Those of us who are left, remember? Those of us who are left, the wicked have been taken, they're destroyed, we're left. Together we're caught up to be with Jesus in the air. There's no one left on this earth. So the thousand years begins when Jesus comes for the church. And he was prevented from deceiving the nations anymore for a thousand years. They came to life. They reigned with Christ a thousand years. Verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So now we see two resurrections. One at the beginning of the thousand years. That's the righteous. That's us if we die first. At the end of the thousand years, the rest of the dead. Who's that? The wicked. They're resurrected. So they're two separated by 1,000 years. If I die, I want to be in the first resurrection. Not the second one. So now we see the boundaries for the millennium, 1,000 years, two resurrections, the resurrection of the good, the bad. Remember what Jesus said? The time is coming when all who are where? In the grave will hear my voice. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Two resurrections a 1,000 years apart. So we're taken up to be with Christ for a thousand years. The devil is on this earth. The wicked are dead. What's he doing on this earth? What are we doing up there? Well, notice again, verse 4, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. The Bible even tells us that we're going to judge even angels. So, what do we judge? Why do we judge anything? Because there are going to be a lot of surprises when we get there on that day. You're going to see people there you never dream would make it. I can't wait to be there. You know what I'm looking forward to? I'm looking forward to all my friends from that Christian college that I used to go to where I turned away from God, and I'm going to see them there, and they're going to say, Jack Cologne, is that you? <laughs> I can't wait. There are going to be some surprises. What are you doing here? <laughs> and I can tell my story. And they'll say, praise God. He didn't make a mistake. I belong here because of the blood of Jesus. There are going to be some other kinds of surprises, disappointments, people we thought surely would be there. Favorite preacher, favorite Bible teacher, relatives, friends, the good deacon who's the only one that would ever mow the lawn in the hot sun in the summertime. Surely he would be there. Where is he? And about that time, an angel comes walking by. And you say, angel, my deacon, why is he not here? And the angel says, you shut up. We don't ask questions up here. <laughs> Thrones are seated. 
for those who have been given authority to judge. The angel says, come here. Opens the books. There it is. I didn't know. I didn't know. Every question is going to be answered so that when God finally destroys the wicked and saves the righteous, everyone will know that it is an act of love and God has done the right thing. And sin will never rise up again. But he's not finished yet. There's still another piece to make sure that sin never rises up again. We have more. Verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. How does that happen? The wicked are raised up again. And he goes out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. So now Gog and Magog are not some little country. They are all the wicked from the four corners of the earth. All the wicked. And they gather them for battle. In number, they're like sand on the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth and surround the camp of God's people, the city that he loves. So the new Jerusalem comes back down to this earth. The wicked are raised up. The wicked surround it. Satan says, let's attack the city. Look, they're just a few. We're so many. Here's our chance. We're like sand on the seashore. So they go to attack the city. They surround the camp. But fire comes down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown. And they'll be tormented day and night forever. Why does God raise up the wicked and then destroy them again? Why don't he just let them stay dead? Here's why. I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. In verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The judgment. The lake of fire is the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. They're raised up again. The wicked are raised up again to appear before the great white throne. Why? Because the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When does that happen? That's the very last thing. Even Satan himself is included in that every. He's going to acknowledge that God is right, that he was wrong. He's had a thousand years to think it over. He doesn't repent. The wicked don't repent. They don't want to be in that city. There would be nothing there for them to do for eternity. Boring for them. And they're cast into the lake of fire. And that's the last piece that convinces everyone that God is just. God is love. And sin will never rise up again. What a story. Do you realize that every being who has le ever lived on this earth is going to be present on that day? All the wicked? All the righteous. The righteous will be inside the city because that's where the lamb is and they follow the lamb. The wicked on the outside. Everyone's going to be there. You are going to be there. You can't change that. The only thing you can change is where will you be? Inside the city or on the outside wishing you were inside? Just follow the Lamb. Well, Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for Jesus who gives us life 
and has paid the price. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hello, I'm Lynn Bryson, pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in McMinnville, Oregon, where we've been filming this Revelation Now series on this set that you've been watching on your television. You may have some questions right now, and perhaps you'd like to receive Jesus in your heart, but you're not quite sure how to do that. If that's your desire, then I invite you to bow your head with me and pray and repeat the words after me. Dear Lord and Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior. I want to invite him into my heart right now. Please come in and forgive me for my sins. And thank you for the free gift of salvation. I know that Jesus is preparing a place for me in your house. And I'm eager to see you. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, then congratulations, because you have received Jesus into your heart. Now you may be wondering right now, what am I supposed to feel? Or perhaps you're feeling a peace coming into you that you've never felt before. Both are normal. Don't rely on your feelings, though. Believe God's word and believe that what he has said is true, that he loves you and that he has forgiven you. This is the perfect time to find answers to some of your questions. And if you do have questions, I would invite you to locate a Seventh-day Adventist church in your local area. Seventh-day Adventist churches are listed in the phone books, and you can find one by going to the yellow pages or the white pages. Or you can get on the internet and do a Google search for Seventh-day Adventist churches. Or you may want to just go ahead and call the McMinnville Church right here in Oregon. If you're calling from the United States, our phone number is 503 472 7841. Or you could email us at sdachurch at onlinemac.com. Or go to our webpage at www.mcminnvilleadventist.org.